Heavens above, after such a build-up and following on from the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, who can follow that? Um, thank you very much, Simon. It's a real pleasure to be here as a Scot uh, and as a, a green, green banker from SEB and as chair of the UK's Green Finance Institute. Um, because what was just a simple conversation five years ago to try and galvanise uh, interest in green finance has now become an extraordinary movement. Uh, and it was great to be here to something called ethical finance. And I thought to myself, well, surely all finance is ethical. Aren't we bankers all behaving ethically all the time? And as we heard this morning, no, we're not. So I think what many of us have realized is that we need to be able to demonstrate to all our stakeholders that we are doing what we preach. It, is, it has not been lost on the banking industry that purpose-linked finance has provided a way for us bankers to reconnect with the societies that we serve. Um, we can learn from Islamic banking, of course, and this can't be a bad thing. Green finance does that reconnecting brilliantly. I also think we're winning the war on bringing climate risk into finance, even if there are still many battles to be fought urgently. And green finance is turning out to be one of the best vehicles there is to promote that integration of climate risk into financial risk. We all know that finance can play a unique and transformative role to drive behavioral transition. And like you, I believe in the power of finance to make people change the way they behave, the way they live. It's why banking is such an interesting business. We have the possibility of influencing the way people behave financially. The economic risk of climate change is complex, which is why it's taking some time, I think, for a consensus to form around the right way forwards. One simple reason is that carbon dioxide emissions, they live there with consequences for the next 50 years, where not in the next 12 months, which for many of us is our normal time horizon. Yes, there's a strong scientific consensus on the connection, the fundamental connections between greenhouse gas emissions and rising temperatures, but the probability of different outcomes is still uncertain. Even accurately measuring carbon levels turns out to be rather more challenging than we th thought it would be, and yet, climate risk is clearly with us. And let, let me give this some banking context, because there is, there is a growing understanding of the many economic channels through which climate change may affect forecasts and thereby economic policies and corporate behavior and share price behavior and bank credit policy. It's true of direct physical risks and physical damage, as well as the costs of transitioning to a fossil-free, fossil-less fuel-free society. In the last year, many of the most newsworthy non-political items have involved the short-term impact of extreme weather events, such as the consequences of storms and floods, fires and crop failures. And that's not just in the US or the Pacific Rim. The drought in several European countries led to forest fires and to lower production, higher prices for agricultural products, not least in Sweden. The share prices of several major paper companies fell. Pension funds were affected. And household costs went up, food prices, so the mortgage market, average capital credit, also fell. When I mentioned this recently to a Swedish friend, she said, well, maybe, but we had the best summer we've ever had. So I thought, OK, a bit of messaging still to go through. I spent, <laughs> I spent my, my, home, uh, my, my summer here at home in Scotland. And how do you know when it's summer in Scotland? The rain gets warmer. <laughs> and it was a bit like that this summer. But no, it wasn't too bad at all. Um, an economy is going to be affected more and more by political reaction to climate change and by how popular opinion reacts. Last year's German economic slowdown was partly due to lower auto production because of new emissions tests brought in by Dieselgate. Jaguar Land Rover wrote off 3.6 billion at the end of last year, largely due to political climate-related decisions about diesel engines. We lent to them, and we had to downgrade the risk two notches. More capital needs to be applied. It becomes a more expensive loan in our portfolios. The Yellow Vest Gilets Jaunes protests in France were triggered by political petrol tax increases related to climate concern and contributed to reduced activity in the service sector in the fourth quarter. And the seriousness with which we are all treating climate risks is suddenly evident, as though the financial community has crossed some sort of credibility line when it comes to looking at climate risk, literally in just the last two years. It's no longer just for environmentalists, that stopped a few years ago, and it's no longer a marginal financial product. For us in finance, the goal is clear. If there is a climate risk which can be identified, then it can be measured. Then we can meet the risk, building resilience on the one hand, and making better, perhaps more ethical credit decisions on the other. 
And for doing that, we should be seeking ways of achieving a lower pillar one capital weighting for those loans, making green loans a better loan in every way. If we crack that, we've cracked climate risk challenge for banks. And I can tell you that we, along with several other banks that I know of, are actively looking at how to bring in differentiated risk ratings based on climate, as well as the usual credit factors. We're doing it right now. I expect it to come in next year in our bank. So any banker or investor who is not thinking now about how to introduce this aspect into their analysis of companies is likely to underperform. Similarly, I don't meet any corporate treasurers or finance officers who are not aware of the need to address climate concerns from shareholders, investors, and risk analysts. We know this. A decade ago, sustainable investment was about signaling awareness, sometimes at the cost of a slightly lower return. In the last five years, most investors have started to assume that they can do this without sacrificing return. The reality is that both green bonds and sector-neutral equity ESG strategies have been outperforming their benchmarks for at least two years. This is a trend that will only get stronger going forward because it's not now just about signaling awareness, but about mobilizing capital for better business investments that can speed up the transition. Most banks I see are overexposed to risk and underexposed to opportunity. And there are fundamental economic reasons why companies that invest in sustainable technologies are likely to get stronger growth and lower default risk in the future. The renewable energy cluster in particular is already showing growth patterns identical to those seen in earlier product revolutions. The first part of the story is about technology. This says that as the new energy technologies are now superior to the old, even in the absence of a climate risk crisis, Markets would drive growth and drive down prices at the same time. It's clearly happening in solar, in wind. Battery, coming. Hydrogen, not there yet. Fusion, don't write it off. For an investor, buying into better tech on a falling cost curve and leading the way embedding those factors into your business model has always been a driver of long-term competitive advantage. It was the case with IT, with chips, with mass production technologies, the first wave of electrification, all the way back to the steam engines. It's the same story. Don't we all wish we'd bought shares in Microsoft and Apple in their early days? Or Henry Ford motor cars, a hundred years ago, when some people said cars will never take off so much more trouble, so much less economic than a carriage and a horse. The second part of the story is about politics and regulation, which I touched on earlier. All the scientists suggest that renewables growth is not fast enough, and we need to move much faster to halt the climate crisis before it's too late. As a result, there is a powerful incentive for societies to speed up the transition process using any means available. Politicians know this. They heard it again two weeks ago in New York from our young Swedish friend. It's a message we've all been hearing today. I suspect we're on the converted side of the curve. Politicians don't always know how to tackle the problem, but they know it's there and that they have to try to do something, like banning diesel engines or encouraging renewables from subsidies. So things are changing fast and changing the way that is taking the environment and especially the energy transition to the very heart of finance in lending and investing. And that's why I say I think we're winning the war, even if there are many battles still to fight. Let's think for a moment about the EU's new taxonomy framework, which marks a major change towards a more realistic transition strategy. It says the capital that can be mobilized has to be used in the sectors that currently have high emissions, because only here can you get significant enough reductions. The basic elements in the strategy are the taxonomy, definitions, which identify a range of activities in the high emission sectors where we can contribute by abiding by things like um, specific maximum emission levels. There's a green bond framework which allows for a wider range of issuers and a wider range of eligible products. Think light green for transition, dark green for pure zero carbon. Disclosure recommendations that explain how both portfolio managers and companies can share the information about their exposures that is crucial for all of this to materialize in practice. Benchmark portfolio guidelines that directly state that sustainable investors cannot underweight the high emission sectors, but have to work with them, inside them, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Very interesting. The common denominator here is that instead of excluding high emission sectors from sustainable portfolios, oil and gas, the framework urges us to create a race between companies in the very same sectors 
to complete the transition fastest, leading to better funding costs and better access to capital. Think Orsted of Denmark, now one of the world's most prominent wind turbine producers, previously called Danish oil and natural gas, with currently zero oil and gas assets left. Going forwards, lenders and investors are likely to see it as a red flag if companies don't disclose exposures. They will shift allocations towards those that have the most credible transition plans. It's happening. And we shouldn't underestimate the effect of the regulators, the impact of the regulators, because they're playing a key role in catalyzing TCFD implementation, amongst other things. We heard from Sarah Breeden of the Bank of England and uh, Susan Rice of the Banking Regulator this morning um, talking about how to green finance, how to make the whole finance system a, a greener, greener um, understanding around it. And through their landmark report, the Network for Greening the Financial System has given us a very strong statement of intent on climate risk. The UK government, led by Bayes, is actually doing, demonstrating really strong commitment to addressing climate risk, stimulating a robust environment for green finance. It has, uh, through the clean, clean Growth Strategy, and now the new Green Finance Institute, shown its commitment. I wonder if they realise there are votes in green as well. A few words to finish about the Green Finance Institute that we launched just a few months ago and its role in accelerating the mainstreaming of green finance. Financing green, if you like, alongside Susan and Sarah's work, greening finance, to make that differential. The GFI is an independent company, initially funded by the UK government and the City of London Corporation. Our mission is to focus on actively mobilising capital towards an emission-free and climate-resilient economy. 2050 came in, zero carbon 2050 came in after the GFI was set up. We're delighted to have that as a kind of guiding principle. We're financed by government, led by bankers, and we are positioned as the principal interface between the public and private sectors regarding green finance in the UK. The operating model is based on bringing together experts from industry, from finance, from academe, from civil society, and government in coalitions, looking at specific tasks. These focus on identifying and then unlocking the barriers to capital flows towards defined challenges, retrofitting our building stock for one, avoiding further deforestation from imported commodities for another, and financing climate resilient infrastructure for the third. These are the three initial areas of focus we're pursuing, seeking financial solutions and innovation to scale up the investments needed as quickly as we possibly can. Setting aside the complexities and the technicalities, we also see a very human dimension to the zero carbon transition needed across financial services. Put simply, it's very hard to give up doing transactions of business you understand for those that you don't. And I believe, based on the models of disruption we've seen in other industries, introducing successful green financial products and instruments will pivot banks and capital markets towards a greener path. It can really work, embedding science firmly into global finance, all aiming to transform the way that we behave financially. So I think there are many challenges going ahead. There are some red lights on the road. There are some green ones too, and even some blue ones out there, new blue bonds issued. Perhaps one of the main messages I want to give is that ethical finance must be about managing risk, about making that commercial return, and doing it in the right way. It sounds simple. Green finance can be one of the methods, the vehicles with which we do that. Many of the actions that society, including the financial community, are taking today are almost unrecognizable from where we were just a few short years ago. It's really tremendous and it's urgently needed. So I encourage all of you, particularly the bankers, to get involved, get thinking, get moving, get onto your credit committees and make them start thinking about how to get that pillar one capital allocated the right way so that we can make green finance the most obvious thing to do. Thank you very much.